I have to say that in relation to this issue, I'm in the Rupert Murdoch school of thinking, and that is where we absolutely have to give our planet the benefit of the doubt. So I think that all efforts should be made to try and help our environment going into the future, without question. And funds, like all other large organisations, have a key role to play here. Right now we're experiencing a debt crisis. It was created by debt. What we don't want to see in the future is an environmental crisis created by environmental unsustainability. And as superannuation funds, our role is to make sure that we look at risk management. Climate change is just one of those things and we have to take it seriously. We've conducted some fairly detailed research uh, about three years previous which, uh, which demonstrated that there is a demonstrable value add by applying those principles over the longer term. And the, the fundamental, I think, principle of superannuation and investment should be sustainability. And I think there's no question that sustainability is really about um, making good decisions based on good principles. Those funds that can position themselves and their underlying investments for the conditions that are going to be around in 2015 and 2020 and 2030 are those funds that are going to deliver sustainable long-term returns to their members. Those funds who can't glimpse the future, who can't understand where the shift to a low carbon economy is going to demonstrate value, they will fall behind. There's no question investors can outperform by investing in green related technologies. As to quote uh, the portfolio manager for our clean, clean technology fund in the US, you can hug a tree and make money too. Climate change is one of the largest environmental, social and economic challenges we face this century. And financial institutions, including superannuation funds, will play a vital role in the move towards cleaner technologies. The young people that I meet up with, generally speaking, are very interested in ethical investing and making sure that they are uh, investing sustainably. However, there's a whole other 95% of young people, generally, you answer these questions. Number one, yes, you have this thing that we call superannuation. Uh, two, no, it's not a bank account. Three, no, sorry, you can't have it now. And uh, four, oh, sorry, what was the question again? Later this year, as you know, the United Nations will convene a meeting in Copenhagen to negotiate or to begin the, to negotiate a treaty to replace the Kyoto Protocol. The election of the Rudd government in Australia and the Obama victory in the United States brings both countries to the table as willing partners in a new treaty and I guess offers some better prospect of success with the United States inside the tent to enable us to see the broad context of what can or should be achieved, CMSF has invited Paul Gilding to brief us on, I guess, what we could call the state of play. When Paul has concluded his presentation, I've been asked to make a few brief comments on what super funds might be able to do about the issue of climate change, although I'm preceded by some very good suggestions already, I notice. Uh, and what we might do to contribute to public policy on um, climate change. Paul's current roles include as a member of the core faculty at Cambridge University Program for Sustainability Leadership and as a special advisor to, on climate change to KPMG. Please welcome Paul Gilding. Just a little <laughs> bit more context for my remarks. I'm going to talk to you in a sort of broad sweep of sort of global issues on these questions over long periods of time. Um, not focusing too much on today's issues, but focusing very much on the longer term questions in this area and why they're so important and how they're going to change for you and for all of us going into the future. The, I've been working on this issue, as Michael said, for kind of 35 odd years, first 20 of those as an activist, um, ranging from ch chasing nuclear warships when Mavis Robertson was um, the head of p and a long time ago and I was a young fella. Um, through to heading up Greenpeace and then more recently, um, the last decade or so, working with big companies in this issue. So my specialty is, is not a sector or an issue, but really the way the issues move through society. So that's really what I think I understand very well. And I want to talk to you about that particular question. So first of all, anybody who in this room who doesn't accept the basic climate science, I'll talk to you later, out the back of the shed. Um, there's not much hope for you. 
Um, but seriously, there is, there is in society now very little question on these issues at the basics. There is lots of questions about speed, scale, what impact will be on the Gold Coast versus so and so, but the basic science is now accepted. And there is no credible argument to not take that seriously as a major risk. Of course, it could be completely wrong, right? It's certainly a possibility. Um, but it's in the 1% possibility, not in the 20% possibility or the 40% possibility. So you'd be a nut to ignore that as a social question because the science is very clear. But I do want to talk about the science that's coming through lately because I think it's really important to understand how much this issue has shifted just very recently. And this will take another five years to move through the system, but if you look at the science in this area, every parameter that we look at, whether it be sea level rise, the rate of sea level rise, whether it be temperature, CO2 concentrations, CO2 emissions, you know, the intensity of bushfires, of course, intensity of droughts, hurricane speed, everything we measure is at the upper end of the forecast of 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, the scientists said, look, we're not sure, we think it's in this kind of range. Everything's at the top here. So every single measure of any consequence is at the top. And that means that beyond that, when, when it starts to go up, as it's forecast to go up like that, that gets faster, right, and it gets harder, and it gets much more difficult to respond to it. So that's a really important context, is the people who specialise in this issue are now saying, now I'm scared. Right? Now I'm getting really worried because it's happening much more quickly and much more intensely than we expected it to, and that means everything we forecast, which was bad enough, right, is going to be worse than we expected. So that's a problem. Now, the reason that's such a problem is because um, climate change is not the problem. Climate change is the symptom of the problem, right? The problem is a much deeper malaise we have in our society, which is that we ignore the consequences on the environment and society around us in order to pursue a narrow goal, right? And that is a deep problem with the way we, we currently structure our economy, the way we currently structure our system, and that, I would argue, is, is what we're facing right at the moment. So when people say, you know, this is a global financial crisis, I say this is not a crisis, right? If you want to see a crisis, just keep watching, because this is definitely not a crisis. We have got a crisis coming, but this is not it. This is a minor hiccup. And the reason I say that so comprehensively is based on the science, not of just climate change, but of the whole system. So just let me give you, some, I'm sure there's some mathematical geniuses in the room. Sorry, I'm not one of them, but I'll give it to you a bit simpler than that. Let me tell you how the global ecosystem works at a very simple level. A few years ago, there was an assessment done by a group called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. 2,000 scientists looking at all the peer-reviewed science of what's called earth sciences or ecosystem sciences. So looking at the whole system as a whole. Right? And what they concluded was, looking at that science, was that there is, they looked at 25 ecosystem services, so not the environment and how it's going, right? as though it was over there, but not how it's going, but how we're going in the things that we draw from the ecosystem. Right? So that's forests for timber, for, for, for fibre and so on. It's uh, forests for absorbing CO2. It's water to drink for agriculture. It's quality of land. It's fisheries. You know, it's all the services that we take every day from the environment to, to feed our economy, right? which is the healthy thing to do. There's nothing wrong with using the environment to support us. That's a good thing in principle. Now, the trouble is, of those 25 ecosystem services that we depend upon, 16 are being used unsustainably. So that means 16 of the 25 are now in decline. Right? This is before we look at climate change. So 16 of the 25 core ecosystem services are in decline. In other words, they're going backwards in terms of the quality. We're drawing the capital faster than the system can replace it. So you have that and you have climate change, which we understand pretty well now. So let's just call that what we currently have now existing, measurable today. Let's call it, in technical terms, very big problem. Right? VBP. It's a very big problem. It's a very big problem. Believe me, it's a very big problem. Then our plan is, and this is the, the intention of every government in the world, of every, every business manager, of probably most super funds included, we're going to grow that thing faster. Right? First of all, we're going to increase population by 50%, um, and that's pretty much a given. If any of you have any great ideas about how to stop sex and stuff, then I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, but I can't find a solution to that one. Um, so we're going to have a 50% increase in population. There are things you can do about population, but they don't have an impact for a long time. Right? And most of the people who will have the babies that will cause that 50% increase have already been born. Right? And they're not likely to change that attitude in the short term. So we're going to have a 50% increase in population. So very big problem, plus 
Then we're going to increase the per capita income of those 9 billion people from today, per capita income, by about 300 per cent, right? plus or minus you know, 2 to 400, but in that rate, let's call it 300 per cent. So what that looks like is a very big problem times 1.5 times 3. Right? For those of you like me who didn't finish high school, um, that's a very big problem times 4.5. Really, really, really very, 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 very big problem. Right? Now, this is not a philosophical point of view is my point. This is a problem that we physically can't do. Right? There is not enough space on the planet. There is not enough trees, there's not enough water, there's not enough land. We can't do that. Now, we can't do that unless we change one of those three parameters. We can change the population growth, which I challenge you to tell me how to do that in the next 30 or 40 years. It's not a long-term issue, it's a now issue, so that's a problem, hard to fix. We can stop economic growth. We're trying that at the moment, right? Doesn't seem to be very popular. Anyone in favour of that solution here? Not many, okay. In fact, I can't find any. So stopping population growth, not a very good solution to it. Well, um, stopping economic growth, not a very good solution to it. So what we have to do is change a very big problem. We have to reduce it a lot. Now, we have to reduce the very big problem by about 80% if we don't increase per capita income, right? if we don't increase population. Given we're going to increase them by 450%, we've got to reduce the very big problem by a very large amount. Now, that's the end of your primary school math lesson. Um, trust me, we've got a problem and we're going to have to fix it because going forward there is no option but to fix it. There is no alternative but to dramatically change the way we do our economy. Now, if you think about that though, think about what we're in now, think about the scale of that change, think about that we're already having a crisis, we've already got the worst bushfires ever recorded, the highest temperatures ever recorded, the fastest rates of melting ever recorded, etc, etc. So all these issues are now issues. And CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for a long time, so it stays around for a very long time and it keeps on having an impact for 100 and to around 15% of it for 1,000 years. Right? So it stays around for a long time. So we've got a big problem now caused by yesterday's pollution. So today's pollution will keep causing a problem for some time to come. That means a very big problem has a lot of momentum in it, which is a big, a big issue. So this is about a system. Right? The system in which we exist, in which we live, is a complex, interrelated system of economics and ecology. Right? So we've designed a very clever system. Um, it's very clever for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's very clever is because it's incredibly complex and interconnected, which we thought in July last year was a really excellent idea. Really clever. Right? It's now looking pretty stupid. Because what happens when you have a big risk inserted in that system, the whole system starts to shake and vibrate and fall apart. And they'll say, this is not a crisis. So that's, that complexity is a problem. But the environmental impact, I think, is actually a, a, a problem because it causes more risk to that system. So it creates more of a change in that process. Now, what happens when a system like that hits its limits? You know, I wrote a piece in July last year called The Great Disruption. Those are the good old days when oil prices were high and food prices were high and your funds were enormously successful and everything was really going very well. Um, and what I said was it's extremely unpopular at the time, was this is the system hitting the wall. Right? We are about to face a crash of the ecosystem and the economy because the the system as a whole is bouncing up the edges of its limits. Right? Now, back to my failed high school career, we did petri dishes of bacteria. When they get to the edge of the petri dish, they stop growing because there's no space for them to grow. That's what systems do. That's what this system was doing in July last year. As oil prices were going up, food prices were going up, etc., because of the drought and so on. So the system reaches the edge of its limits and it, and it draws back. Now, that is what has happened to the system. Now, in this case, it was probably complexity rather than the ecological impacts directly, but with a system that complex, you cannot tell. And if you think you can, then just look at the oil price. Now, we can't forecast the oil price, right? A very simple commodity in a very simple market, and we get the forecast wrong by a factor of four, right? So the idea that we think we can therefore predict the behaviour of the global economy, tell them they're dreaming. We have got no idea how it works. We don't know how to fix it until after it's broken, right? Then we go and do it again. Right. It is simply too complex to manage with high degrees of risk in it, and that's where we face now. So someone, uh, um, Tom Friedman wrote about my work a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, and he referred to this moment, this great disruption, as I call it, as when 
uh, Mother Nature and Father Greed hit the wall at once. Right? So I think it's a lovely way of thinking about it. When Father Greed and Mother Nature hit the wall at once, right? the crisis starts to emerge and we start to get a problem. Someone else he quoted in the article, Joseph Rom from Climate Progress blog, describes this as the world's biggest Ponzi scheme. Because right? what we're doing is we're getting future investors, i.e. tomorrow's investors, right, to put money in for the payout that we're taking now. There is no return on capital. We are simply taking money from the capital right, to pay out ourselves now, and therefore the Ponzi scheme, like all Ponzi schemes, will collapse. So it's another thing, it's just another, another way of looking at it. So I don't know about you, but I don't think you believe this could keep on going. I mean, really, when last year when we saw the climate falling apart and the oil prices going up and the food prices going up and the economy booming and China going nuts with cars and coal-fired power stations and plastic shit that none of us need for us and them, because they thought that would be good to have more of that stuff in a landfill as well. Um, did you really believe this would keep on going? I mean, did you really believe in your heart that we can keep on growing an economy based on material consumption indefinitely? No, of course you didn't. No, it's not possible. What we all hoped was it would fall apart on someone else's watch. No, it would happen tomorrow rather than today, because none of you could possibly look at the global economy and say, this is going to keep on happening. We're going to keep on digging minerals out of the ground. We'll just get deeper and deeper and deeper and it'll keep on arriving and the oil will always be there and the market will keep on growing and we'll keep on buying more stuff and we'll all be living in landfills in the end but we'll be so happy. I don't think so. I don't think any of us actually believe that was possible. We just hoped it wouldn't happen, as I said, on our watch. Well, bad luck, it did. So that's the end of part one. That's the bad news. Um, it was a bit more bad news, but not much. The, the rest of the... The good news is that the history of humanity says when we have a crisis, we really get ourselves focused. Right? And we do unbelievably extraordinary things. We achieve enormous change very quickly. Right? We, we, we invent technologies and roll them out at extraordinary speed. And I put to you many examples in history. World War II is my kind of favourite, because I think that's where we're kind of going in terms of this sort of issue. You know, World War II, we converted around 70% of industrial capacity of the United States of America after Pearl Harbor in nine months of the war effort. So the car companies were told, you're now making tanks. Right? You used to make poker machines, now you're making guns. Right? The arsenal of the democracy was born. Right? And spending percentage of GDP in the US went from 1%, I think, in 38, 39, to 35% in 45. Right? So enormous change, incredibly quickly, you know, and you didn't get people lobbying the government against it on the grounds that it might upset their shareholders. You know, you can lobby all you like, you'll just be in jail for treason. Right? People didn't argue the issue, they just went and got on with the job. Right? And that is what we're capable of, when we're focused on a sufficient enemy. Now, in this case, the enemy is us in that sense, so it's not the enemy we can go and shoot, unfortunately, um, so it's a bit, bit more complicated. But um, we are going to be able to change in this crisis at extraordinary speed and scale, and that's a very exciting period. Now, the only other bit of bad news is that it's going to get ugly in the meantime. Right? Because the pollution caused in the 70s and 80s and 90s is still coming through the system, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And all the evidence around us today is that the politicians haven't yet got it. Right? There is no one yet we see acting. Obama's the one we're hoping for, but there's no one yet who sees that we really are taking on this issue seriously yet. Certainly Kevin Rudd's not, right? Malcolm Turnbull's not. Um, you don't see anyone, you don't see Gordon Brown doing it. You know, the, the Chinese leadership is looking very interesting in this area, and I think we are going to see some pretty interesting things happening in China, but not yet. Right? So therefore you can say, well, it's not going to change tomorrow. It might change in five years, it might change in ten years, but it's not going to change right away. So therefore the crisis will get worse. Now that's going to lead to a lot more droughts, a lot more bushfires. It's going to lead to, by various estimates, somewhere between 300 and a billion refugees because their countries are underwater or unlivable. Right? That's a lot of people. Right? There is a scheme that says we should allocate the refugees to countries based on their historical emissions, which would kind of double the population of America really quickly, which is a kind of interesting example, I think, of how we might do it. But we're going to have a lot of them here too because we're up there with the best. Um, per capita. So I think there is, there is going to be a lot of suffering, jokes aside, in this world, right? And we are going to see that. And we're not used to it, actually. It's not really since World War II that we've had suffering on a global scale, right, that we're used to making those sacrifices for. And we're going to have to get used to that. 
Well, there's going to be a lot of intense bushfires. There's going to be a lot of flooding. There's going to be a lot of countries that will become unlivable and large, in, completely in some cases, in the Pacific Island states and, some, and, and, and other countries like Bangladesh and China and India and other. There's going to be lots of areas that become really dangerous places to live and therefore people will move. I wouldn't want to be in property in those areas, by the way, just as a topical local issue here. You know, there are some pretty interesting predictions now about one to two metre sea level rise by 2100. That won't involve any of you investing in that because you won't be around unless you've got some really good technologies in biotech that'll keep you alive that long. But we are going to see a panic response shortly on real estate. Now, one year, five years, 10 years, but it's in that, in that range. When people say, hang on, if I'm putting a building up here and in 50 years time it's going to have to be shut down or have a two metre dike put around it, what's that do to my risk? How do I ensure that? How do I lend for that? So I think there are some interesting issues coming, but they're not, not for today. Just giving you a moment there to think about your lifeboats and your apartment blocks. <clears throat> so the really good news is that, like in a war, when we get focused, we'll get really focused, right? And we'll get really um, specific about making change happen incredibly quickly. And it will not be like it is today. The only, as I said, relevant comparison is World War, when we say we have to achieve this. Now, um, uh, great examples of this recently. So in the Australian stimulus package, right, we put, uh, I think it was 10% of our stimulus package into, the, into creating green jobs. Good, good move, 10%, good start. The US put, I think, 12% of their stimulus package into green jobs. So a bit better than us, but you know, bigger country, interesting idea. Um, China put 33% of their stimulus package into the environmental area. Right? Korea put two-thirds of their stimulus package into the environmental area. Right? So they're putting tens of billions of dollars into this area while we're still messing around. So that was done on very short notice, right? without much thought, and yet we did all these amazing things there. We are going to do extraordinary things. We're going to do them very quickly. Um, there's a great article in gave me before about you know, a study done last week saying that, that if we had spent, uh, you know, we, we could actually um, turn around the Australian electricity sector for around half the cost of our stimulus package. Right? Now, extraordinary things are possible very quickly, and that's where I get really excited. And I've been through despair on this issue. You know, when, when I think about the consequences, I go through months, sometimes years, of thinking this really is hopeless. I mean, we really are hopeless. We the environmentalists, we humanity, you know, we the West, it's just an impossible task to change. I don't buy that anymore. I've actually come to a much more comfortable position that says, looking at history, we are slow, but we're not stupid. Right? We do take a long time to respond, but then we respond very quickly when we do, and we do extraordinary things. And that's where I get excited and think, oh, what does that look like? How do we do that? And the answer is we know how to do everything we need to do. Everything. We don't need to invent anything new. Now, if we can invent some new stuff, that'd be great, it'd be faster, it'd be cheaper, but we can do it today. Right? We could, for example, double the price of electricity and halve its consumption with today's technology, and that would be sufficient to transform the electricity sector. And it's very easy to cut electricity consumption by half right? with current technology, basic stuff, insulation. Right? More high, more, better, better quality air conditioning systems, different lighting. We know how to do that stuff with today's technology and it pays for itself. So we can fix the electricity sector like that with the right sort of policy incentives. We can fix transport. Right? We know how to do um, hybrid electric cars now at scale. We know how to do electric cars that you just change the battery over rather than recharging it. So you can change it in a, in a petrol station, drive in, change your battery, move on in three minutes. Save your coffee, buy your pie, back to, back to driving. So we know how to do that stuff, right? We're going to have to pay more for that, but we're going to have to pay for it anyway. The question is when we pay for it and how we pay for it. So we know how to fix that. We know how to fix agriculture to reduce emissions dramatically. We know how to plant trees at massive scale to absorb large amounts of carbon to buy us a bit of extra time. We know how to make our buildings spectacularly more efficient, right, profitably, right? And we do that on a regular basis. We just don't do it at scale yet. So every one of these solutions that we need to do, we can do and we know how to do. Perhaps most importantly, in terms of what we know how to do, is we know that buying stuff doesn't make us happy. Now, this is the saddest news of the day, <laughs> right? Shoes, that's you half. Fast cars, that's you half. Don't work. They give us distraction. 
they give us a sense of feeling good for the day. I mean, we all do it. It's not, this is not a guilt you know, thing. We all do it. I do it. I love buying new stuff. Hardware shops are my thing. I can walk with my, my wife for my 40th birthday gave me unrestricted walking around a big hardware shop. <laughs> she said, every time we go there, the other day, once we do this, I want to go home, the kids are bored. I said, she said, we're all going to go with you. We'll sit in the cafe in the play area. You can walk around. It can't take long. <laughs> can't take long. <laughs> Four and a half hours later. You think I'm joking. Four and a half hours later, I'd walk down every aisle and looked at everything. It was just really excellent. So... So none of us are kind of, you know, it's, it's our problem, right? And we have this great deception that buying more stuff is going to make us happy, and it doesn't. Now, having said that, if you're in, a, if you're in an Indian village living in poverty, it really works, right? It really works. So you go from zero to about 30 or 40,000 per capita a year, and you go from serious unhappy to seriously happy, comparatively speaking, right? It really works there. And then it goes like that, and then as you get past 30, different surveys, but between 30 and 100,000, that sort of range, you go from there, and it sort of evens out to about there, and then it stays there. The more money you have, the more money you have, you don't get any happier at all as a country, until you get really, really rich as an individual, and then it goes down again. Right? So the prize in here is being back to misery. It's the circle of life. So what a dumb way to design an economy. What a stupid idea that we had, that we thought was a good idea, that we've completely stuffed up. Right? So this doesn't work. And yet our whole economy depends upon us going and buying more shoes and more fast cars and me going to the hardware shop and buying tools that I never know how to use and couldn't use anyway. Right? doesn't work. And what's our political leader's solution to our economic crisis? Go shopping. Here's some money. Right? Dumb. Really dumb doesn't work, won't work, and we're going to wake up to that. What makes us happy is meaningful work, right? Meaningful work, relationships, so loved ones, family, connections, and community, being part of a safe, supportive community that you can go to when things get tough and just for relationships and support. Right? They're the things that make us happy. Now, none of those things come from the economy once you're out of poverty. Right? The poverty thing, big problem, we've got to fix that. That's a really serious issue. But once you're out of that, getting more doesn't help. So we've got to think about redesigning the global economy. Now, that's really good news to me. Now, it's not good news. I wouldn't want to be in a pension fund or anything. But apart from that, it's, seriously, it's, it's, it's very good news because we know how to do it. Right? It doesn't cost money. It doesn't disrupt the economy. It reinforces the economy. And it makes us more resilient for the crisis that we see coming. So that's, I think, a very important issue. So let me just finish off with a few comments around you and your role, all of us and our roles, right? But in particular, you in the investment community. Um, we have known about this problem for a very long time, right? We've understood it deeply, we've analysed it to death, and we've done sweet FA about it, Right? And we knew it was coming, and um, we are now in the period of consequences, as Churchill said in 1937 about World War II. We are now entering a period of consequences when we see the results of not acting. Right? So we've decided for a long time not to act, to stand silently and observe it, feel concerned, sometimes feel despair, sometimes feel angry, but not stop it. So now we're in a different... Forget that. That's the past. We're now in a space where we're going to change things and make things happen differently. So how do you fit in that? How do we all fit in that? Now, I left Greenpeace a long, long time ago. I went to work in the corporate sector as an advisor to CEOs. thought, I'm going to work where the power is. I want to go and meet these guys that run the world right, and get them to fix it because I know Greenpeace isn't going to do it. Right? We tried. didn't work. Right? So I went to the corporate sector. I'll meet these guys who run, they're all guys, who run these companies and say, okay, let's do it. You know, you've got the money, you've got the resources, you've got incredible power. And they're like, no, I don't. I'm a victim of the market. If I don't do this, they'll do that. And I, come and go, I can't get the company to move here. They all feel powerless. We all feel powerless. Right? As investors, you're all thinking, I'd like to invest, I'd like to contribute towards this, but it's difficult. I don't know how that's going to work. And this rule says that, and this person says that, and da, 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 da. We all feel like that. Right? So the choice we're making is we can all feel like that all the way down or we can stop it. 
because there is no one who's got more power than you have. Right? You can make a decision to have a very big impact on this issue, on the issues that you care about, and what's more, you can do it for your members. Right? You're doing it for the people who you are, you are responsible for looking after. Right? And that is an enormous opportunity. Now, I don't have the answers to what every little blockage that you're going to face. Right? What I do know is that it's only human ingenuity and determination that will make a difference in this issue. It's only that that we can use to shift this question. And it's not going to be the Nelson Mandela of climate change. He's not coming. Right? He's actually in this room. Right? There is no Mother Teresa on climate change. Right? She's up there in row 46, actually. Right? Going to make a big difference to how the future looks. That's what this is going to take. Because we have been looking and explaining to our political leaders and our corporate leaders right, for decades and explaining the rational science in this area and they are blocked. They are unable to respond. It is actually only us, it's only us that are able to shift that. And I'm not saying that's easy, that's difficult. That's going to require you to have courage you didn't know you had. It's going to require you to do things differently you didn't think you could do differently. It's going to require you to face some uncomfortable truths about the system, about yourselves and about your role within it. But there is absolutely the power within you to make a very big difference to this issue. And it is the only hope we've got. You know, my favourite quote I saw recently was, you know, we are the people we've been waiting for. Right? We are the people we've been waiting for. There is no one else coming. It's entirely up to us to decide what the future looks like. So let me just finish with that and have you think about, ask questions and talk about after Mike has spoken about what you can do in this issue. Because we need you to act. We need you to stand up in Canberra. We need you to stand up as investors. We need you to stand up when you're talking to the companies you're investing and say, no, that's not okay anymore. You can't do that anymore. I want to see your plan to change, right, and start to flex the muscle that you've got to make a very big difference. Because um, I think the question to ask yourself at the end of the day, if it's not you that does this, then who is it? Because I want to meet them. And I've been looking for them for 35 years and I can't find them. And I think they're probably in this room. Thank you. I want to turn this over to you as quickly as I can, but I just want to say a few things from the perspective of a trustee and the perspective of uh, an organisation of uh, pension funds. That, As I understand it, the situation is this, that however much public capital is thrown at this problem, it's, it's never going to be enough. So there's going to have to be a major injection of private capital into the kind of investment, we, transformational investment that Paul, or to, to transform societies in the way that Paul's just described. Secondly, as I understand it, and I'm not a scientist, but as I understand it, there are three things that have to happen. There has to be greater efficiency in the use of resources, in the use of fuel, in the use of energy, and there has to be, sadly, quite a deal of adaptation so that the countries in the Pacific and other countries whose uh, time has come, unfortunately, it's a now problem, as Paul described it, they need support and, they, and many parts of uh, developed countries will need support to change their infrastructure in order to meet problems that are already presenting as a, right, as a result of climate change. So efficiency and adaptation is one part. Technology change is another part, investing in new technologies which give uh, much lower carbon outcomes or zero carbon outcomes, and the preservation of rainforests. So those three things, as I'm instructed, all have to happen, and two out of three won't make it. And I hope Paul confirms that that is true. And my understanding of uh, the last one, the rainforest issue, is that it's at the moment because most of the rainforest that we rely upon to be kind of the lungs of the planet, uh, because they're tropical, they're in that band of countries around the world, many of whom don't exactly um, shine in the field of sovereign risk. So something is being attempted by the World Bank and by others, by the Asian Development Bank and many other people are giving attention to de-risking investments so that people like us can invest in rainforest preservation in countries where at the moment we would have no chance on a risk profile basis of investing. Um, so there will be more on that as it becomes available uh, and it may not become available this year but it will become available shortly because it is a necessary part and as Paul says when 
things have to be done, they have to be done, so I'm sure somebody will create uh, investable means by which we can support the preservation of the rainforest, without which the other two things, efficiency and tech change, won't work. Also, we have to say, and, uh, and we always say this, but however much we agree with what Paul has said, and however much we feel strongly ourselves about climate change, uh, the in actual investments we make have to pass the same tests as any other investments that we make. They have to be investable from the point of view of our fiduciary duty to do what's in the best financial interest of our members. But I think we can take that as, as um, I, can, I think we can assume of each other that we will apply the same due diligence to this new kind of investing or these new fields of investment that we've applied to all the previous fields of investment that we've entered. So I'm assuming that, but I'm certainly not discounting it. I think that's a major responsibility for us because it's not our money and it's got to produce a retirement income for our members, notwithstanding the contribution that's capable of making, as Paul has said, to uh, helping to solve these problems. In the listed sector, in the listed equity sector, as we've heard throughout this conference and many other conferences, there's a growth in attention to ESG and it is possible as active owners of these listed companies to change their behaviour. It is possible and it's possible by voting your proxies and by engaging with them and we're going to do that. We're doing both those things much better than we used to do it and we're certainly engaging with them about their governance and about their ESG approach, their carbon performance, their energy performance, their water use performance and so on, much better than we ever did and we're going to get better at it and we're going to be knocking on their doors much more than we ever have before. Because the responsibility for the, the ultimate responsibility for the behaviour of those companies lies with the owners. It doesn't lie with the managers, it doesn't lie with the board, it lies with the owners who appoint the board who appoint the managers. So we can't really walk away from that responsibility and if they're to play a major part in the delivery, particularly of efficiency, the take up of new technology, <coughs> then uh, we have to make sure they are playing the part that we as responsible owners would expect of them. Um, there already are quite a number of offerings in the listed space and some of them are quite ingenious and no doubt they're coming now and presenting their wares to our asset consultants and they will come to us um, from our asset consultants when they're satisfied after due diligence that these uh, uh, equity products uh, uh, meet all the reasonable tests. But I think the issue for us to decide is what policy approach are we going to take to this? I don't think you can have a kind of passive policy where you just wait for good products to be bought to you. I think you have to give a signal to the market that you want them bought to you and you want them examined and you, want, you are interested. There seem to be two broad ways of doing this. Maybe there's many more that you can think of, but I noticed for, that, that the Swedes, for example, who are always very good about these things, uh, talking to them in, in various meetings that I've been lucky enough to go to, they have decided to make uh, substantial asset allocations, like 5% of their total portfolio will go to carbon reducing investment, speci uh, highly specified investments. The difficulty they've had up until now because of the lack of political direction and political regulation of, uh, of these issues is to find enough investable product for their 5% allocation. Another way of doing it is simply to say that we will have an option for carbon reduction in all of our investing profile. We'll put another profile or another layer of consideration into our general investment program so that when we're considering private equity or infrastructure or anything else, and those two equally um, satisfactory propositions, one is carbon reducing and the other is not, we have an option for the carbon reduction um, investment. So we give a kind of priority to carbon reduction wherever it's available uh, and make the selection uh, on the criteria, the kind of criteria that Paul's reinforced this morning. There's also, I think, uh, it's going to be necessary for us to think carefully about our private equity portfolios. If we're going to, these most opportunities are going to come to us in the shorter term in the private equity space, the infrastructure space, perhaps in the green bond space if these green bonds can be properly devised, to, to, as it might apply to, to forests and so on. Um, and 
there's going to be a need for uh, more concentration of effort at the venture end of private capital, uh, more than perhaps most of us are presently invested, which means we need new financial products to be developed and devised so that risk is properly diversified and we can invest at that end and encourage uh, the development and, uh, of uh, new ideas much more quickly perhaps than they're presently being developed. I don't want to take up any more of the time because I want you to talk with Paul. In the public policy space, I don't think we've done as well as we could. AXI and AIST have made submissions about the Green Paper, as many of you know, on the Emissions Trading Scheme. We've had meetings with Senator Wong. We have a positive relationship with her and her office so we can talk to her. Uh, we've endeavoured to keep our position uh, or to interest IFSA in our position on the position that we've taken and they seem to have taken a fairly similar position that we try to maintain uh, liaison so there's no disconnect between the super funds and their fund managers in their attitudes that they might take to these issues going forward, especially the emissions trading scheme. Um, the investor group on climate change has been active. Many of you may already know that Steve Gibbs, the former CEO of ARIA, has been appointed to assist um, the, the investor group on climate change with their public advocacy and with their government relations. And he's, um, I think, tomorrow presenting uh, the views, which would be those views very similar to what we've just heard, to the parliamentary committee looking at the ETS. There's a second parliamentary committee that we have to consider and you might like to consider dealing with climate change policy more broadly, arising from the opposition's new position on climate change and the Greens' position on climate change. So you've got sort of polarity there. One's very dissatisfied that the policy's not rigorous enough and the other one's claiming that the policy's too rigorous. And we have um, uh, opportunities that are likely to flow to us from uh, Infrastructure Australia, where Gary Wiegand is a board member on the board led by Rod Eddington. I don't want to take any more time. There are opportunities. I think we can do more in public policy advocacy, but I don't think we've got time to talk about that today. I think we can talk more about what we can do about the thing that what we do is investment. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. At least we thought we were until very recently. But um, <clears throat> I think we are good at it. And if we, we ought to bring the very best skills we have to be part of the solution of this enormous, very, 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 very big problem as Paul has so accurately described it. So over to you for questions to Paul or points that you would like to air. Louise, num oh, we need number. Number one is, thank you. Louise Davidson from CBUS. Um, it seems to me that whilst there are plenty of investment opportunities that we can look to in the future. We also need to be thinking about what we're doing now with the investments that we're already in. And I'm thinking particularly about the listed companies who are currently lobbying very heavily against a, a much needed reform in the, in the form of the CPRS. I mean, how do we get serious and let those companies know that we actually support a CPRS and we don't support their rent seeking? to do it. One is which I think you are doing, to, govern, to government, and saying, look, whatever they say, we own them, right? And as investors who care about long-term value for society, then we don't support what they're saying. So I think it is about saying directly to government in some cases, we have a different view than that. Our view is this. The other thing which I think is actually more powerful, and I've seen this inside, is going to the companies concerned and saying, I saw you said this, why are you saying that? Now, we are the owners. Right? And we don't think what you're saying there is actually right about the future of our investment. So not a moral position, not a responsibility position, but one purely that says, as the owners of this company, we think our investment will do better if you take this approach. And we're not happy about you taking that approach. And you'd be amazed how much, never in the room, I'm sure, but when you leave the room, you'd be amazed how much impact that has. They, are, they don't like investors, they're just a bloody necessary evil as far as they're concerned, because they should own the company, because they're so smart, most of them. But the, um, I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Um, the, that's why they got the economy in such good shape. The, but they do listen to what you say, and especially when you're acting as a group, but also when you're acting as a group coming in from different angles. Yeah? Yeah. So don't just, again, don't underestimate the impact of you doing that. 
Yeah, Paul, um, Julian Paul from the Climate Institute. You mentioned the uh, transformational challenge of uh, World War II, of course, and the very big problem that uh, uh, we face. But, of course, a lot of that was built on fear. Uh, and Michael paid reference to almost the hedging approach of the asset allocations that are going on in parts of Scandinavia, for example, where they're allocating up to 5% of their fund. Um, but how do you engage the other side of the equation? How, how do you engage the psychology of opportunity for asset owners um, and create this into a more positive space? I mean, there's plenty of asset owners who are looking at risk, physical impact risk, future carbon risk, and, uh, um, carbon price risk, and so forth. But how do you sort of uh, you know, create a, the feeling that there's, a, frankly, a great deal of money to be made here? Mm. Most people um, are motivated more by fear than they are by opportunity in all of our lives. Right? It's just a reality of how psychology works. So I think it's a big, important question. The, I think it's about getting them in balance every time you communicate it. Right? So I think, you know, as you see when I'm presenting on the issue, and which I do a lot of, I've come to the conclusion that if I just focus on the negatives, right, you all go away being depressed and disabled and, and can't act. Right? If I just focus on the positive, it's like, oh, that's nice, OK, back to normal behaviour. And there's no response. So the motivation's not there to act. And so you have to actually get them both together. But it's very, very important that we talk all the time about the economic opportunity, right? That we recognise that replacing every car in the world is actually a huge opportunity. That rebuilding the electricity sector is actually a huge opportunity, a profitable opportunity with long-term job creation and actual better job creation, right? Better jobs and more of them than the current economy has. So I think it's about just keeping on talking about that, but ultimately, you know, markets are basically lemmings. So it is about creating examples of success, right? So really, and then celebrating examples of, of success. So that's awards, that's marketing, that's, you know, about showing what the great opportunities exist in this area and recognising that we are, however, moving into a disruptive process where there'll be lots of failure. This is the dot-com boom, right? There'll be lots of failure and there'll be Microsoft and Google, et cetera, coming out of it. So we're, we're kind of going to balance that, that expectation as well. John O'Flaherty from uh, Super SA, Paul. Um, I'd be interested in your uh, views on nuclear energy, nuclear mm -hmm. power. Um, in South Australia, we've got one of the biggest uranium mines in the world, I think, or will be. Um, is this something that we've actually <laughs> solved the problems, or is it this in terms of we, we know how to uh, generate the power, but we mm -hmm. don't actually know how to get rid of the waste? Yeah. So is this something on your radar, or is yeah. this something that, uh, as investors, we should be steering well away from? Yeah. It's on my radar because I get asked it every time I give a speech, so it's definitely on my radar. Um, and I think it's, I have a kind of a, a range of views on this issue. Having spent much of my activist career as an anti-nuclear activist, right, so I've got a, a steeped in the whole history of that issue, more from the weapons side than the power station side because I'm an Australian, but same principles. So a couple of things I would say. First of all is that I'm, I'm no longer kind of ideologically, ideologically obsessed by the anti-nuclear thing, right? I was for a long time. Um, and I just don't think it's anywhere near as dangerous in a, in a physical, literal sense as we said it was and as we thought it would be. Nuclear weapons, absolutely, but nuclear power, the reality is, like it or lump it, I don't like it at all, it really annoys me, more people have died from sausages and coke than from nuclear power. Right? So it's uncomfortable truth that the nuclear industry, with some notable, very significant exceptions like Chernobyl, have by and large killed a lot less people than coal, a lot less people than oil, a lot less people than lots of industries, right? So we, we kind of get too obsessed about that reality. So that's comment one. Comment two, I still think it's a really stupid idea. I mean, it's fundamentally just a stupid idea because why would you do it, right? You do it because it was the safest, cheapest zero CO2 fuel source, or energy source, right? Now, I don't believe it is the safest or the cheapest. I believe that they've been telling us for 50 years it's going to be too cheap to meter and it ended up being too dangerous to go anywhere near for investors. Right? There is no significant scale examples of commercial investment in, in nuclear energy that's not guaranteed by government because the sensible commercial risk manager would, would say, I'm not taking responsibility for a Chernobyl. Right? Government can take on the liability for that. That means it's not commercial. That means the risk is too high from a rational analysis. So I think that's important. The second thing I think about on that issue is the consequences of it going wrong. Now, do I believe we can manage nuclear power basically safely, right, in advanced, democratic, you know, open societies? Yes, we can, right? And we've been doing it for quite a long time, and our record's pretty good. It doesn't mean one won't blow up tomorrow, 
but nevertheless, purely in risk management, we do OK. The trouble is we don't all live in politically stable democracies that were open societies, and we're not going to necessarily do so for the next 100,000 years. Right? So you're putting in place a level of risk that you need to really be think about managing. So again, you would do that if you needed to. But why would you need to when the alternatives have just begun their price dropping curve, right? and nuclear has been doing it for 40 years and hasn't got very far? So even if nuclear went down very well and ended up being safer than we thought and they had new technologies, you've still got to have military levels of security and control over the, over the, over the system versus solar panels on your roof. So I just don't, I just don't get the logic of it, basically. And, and I, my solution to it, by the way, is let the market rip. Right? Take away all government support for it right? and let investors make their own decisions between this technology and that technology because the answer will be absolutely renewables, guaranteed price, long-term supply, you know, known technology with no risks, versus nuclear won't make any sense. But I say don't ban it. Let the market determine the right solution because you'll find out that, that they won't pick it. So that was a long answer, but it's a big issue for me. Doug Robertson, ITM Limited. Uh, Paul, uh, we talked a little bit about FIB, and I'll, I'm feeling brave at the moment. You talked about the worst predictions coming true 20 years here mm -hmm. and now today. Give us 20 or 30 years worst predictions. So um, I don't, really don't think you want to hear the answer to that question. Um, look, the, the biggest problem we face, um, uh, so, so uh, God, I hate this question, um, collapse of civilization. Right? So the short answer is there is absolutely a scenario where we have the collapse of civilization globally. And what it looks like is a runaway climate change impact. So everything going worse than expected, which is what's been happening, so it'll keep on going. You get a positive feedback. I don't know why they call them positive feedbacks, because they're incredibly negative. But positive feedbacks in the system, which means that the, the frozen methane, 70 billion tonnes of one of the most powerful greenhouse gases, locked away under frozen ice in the Siberian, you know, in that sort of northern Arctic, um, is currently bubbling up, by the way. It's not a theory, it's currently bubbling up. If enough of it gets out, methane's a very powerful greenhouse gas that will cause warming, right, by itself and then that warming will overtake anything that we do. At that point, you cannot stop warming. And warming at that level is not two or three degrees, which is catastrophic, which is what we plan, to, we plan for catastrophe. Right? It's, it's really, really, really catastrophic. It's like eight, nine, 10 degrees. Right? It's a 40 to 60 metre sea level rise. You wipe out most civilizations, most coastal areas completely, but it happens incredibly quickly, relatively speaking. Right? So these are the scenarios that people like me worry about and scientists really worry about, right, and are no longer in the realm of science fiction fantasy. They're now in the 10%, yeah, 20% you know, possibility. This is not any longer anything like you know, ridiculous. This is now absolutely within the realm of possibility. Now, before you all go and slip your wrist, I'll go back to the bar, but it's too late, it's closed, I hope, um, is that if we get that in time, even that, if we get that in time, and I think this is where we'll go, by the way, is that we'll have to geoengineer. We'll have to actually take control of the global climate, which is a complete anathema to an environmentalist, completely ridiculous, but you have to do it. And then, for, therefore, you start doing things like, like um, people are talking about, which is some of the most ridiculous ones are putting iron in the ocean so they absorb more CO2 through algae growth. Kills the oceans, but, you know, minor sort of collateral damage. Um, putting th millions of tiny mirrors in space to reflect the heat, right? putting sulphur in the atmosphere so that you get more reflectivity of, of heat from the sulphur particles, then it all falls down and kills the forest, but you know, minor collateral damage. Um, so, but some of these aren't stupid. Some of them are things like, uh, uh, this is my favourite one for the week, I love this one. So someone worked out if you painted all the urban infrastructure, houses, roads, etc., a lighter colour in the case of roads and white in the case of rooftops, in the world's hundreds, hundred largest urban areas, you'd reflect enough heat to counter all the warming to date. It's a lot of jobs for painters. <laughs> CFM, are you here? Great. <laughs> right, so we're talking a lot of paint, right? A lot of sunglasses. Oh my God, that city's bright. <laughs> but there are ideas like that around that says we can actually seize control if we have a kind of war level of mobilisation around it. So, the scenarios kind of go both ways in that sense. But it's, 
The, the, the ugliness is if it breaks down so fast we lose control of the global decision making. Because you cannot do this stuff except globally. Uh, you cannot make a decision on this as a country. You can do it with six or seven countries. You get 70% of emissions thereabouts if you have China, India, EU, US, etc. You can actually get most of them in, 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 there, in there. But you, if you lose control of that, if we start withdrawing into nation state defensiveness, looking after our own, bugger the rest of them, you know, tr fiefdom tribal sort of approaches, then we are stuffed. Because it won't just be stopping at the end, it'll be uh, recovering and pulling it back and you need to have a global response. You ask the question. Anne Byrne from the Australian Council of Super Investors. With the meeting that's happening in Copenhagen to you know, replace Kyoto, what is, do you think is the optimum solution and what do you think will actually happen? Yeah, okay. So the optimal, optimum solution is, is uh, optimism, right? So it's actually not what's made there as a decision. It's we're going to get it together, right? We actually got Obama, we've got the Chinese, the Indians all saying we're going to do something. Right? And so whatever the decision is, the psychology of that, the belief that we can actually move forward right, is going to be the most important thing because if society dips into despair, we're in trouble. So that's what I think is the best outcome. And I don't care what the words say. That will be clear from the mood that we've changed. We've turned direction. We've turned the ship around and we've actually got a hands on the steering wheel at least and we're turning it around. That's, that's the, the, the actual outcome. The most likely outcome is a muddled, sort of messy one. Not a catastrophe, not a failure and not a great outcome, and a, an agreement to come back and try it again a year or two after, I think is the most likely outcome, spun by all the governments as being a major breakthrough, but not really. I, I think it won't change until the crisis hits, and it hasn't hit enough yet in the, in the public consciousness. 